Hey, what's up? How you guys doing? I just want to do like a, a little impromptu live stream. Uh, if you guys are here in the chat, leave me a comment. It makes things a little bit easier so I can kind of bounce my ideas off you guys. But um, in this live stream, I kind of wanted to talk about carpentry and the field of carpentry moving forward and what that's going to look like. <clears throat> I know that um, I've been on my job sites and we have a lack of workers when it comes to a lot of subcontractors, when it comes to these guys who are willing to come in every day, it's really difficult to find quality hands. And I've been reading some articles like throughout the internet and they're saying the same exact thing that carpentry is one of those jobs that is really kind of like looked down on because it doesn't make as much money as maybe some of the other uh, skill trades like HVAC or electrician or plumbers, but it's still highly needed. And I think sometimes carpentry we're slept on because we don't have the same credentials that some of the other trades have. So I want to know what you guys think about that. Also, um, because I uh, have been in the union for about seven years, I've seen it's really difficult to kind of get your uh, your foot in with a good company. And when you don't, it makes it very, very difficult to like uh, to stay on for a long amount of time. You know what I'm saying? So when you first get started in your apprenticeship, you're going to find it very difficult for a lot of companies to take a chance on you. And I think that's one of the most difficult parts about being a carpenter is that especially when you're working in a union where you have to find your own job, it's very, very intimidating to have to go out to a job site, go find out a superintendent, go shake his hand, look him in the eye and ask him for a job. And I think that makes it really difficult to get young guys who are, you know, maybe uh, haven't grown up in that uh, lifestyle, haven't grown up in a a manner where you know you have to be really assertive a lot of people are not really up to a lot of physical contact a lot of people aren't um raised in a way that you know a lot of people are behind their phones now people don't even like talking on the phone people just want to text so that's i think is another huge barrier for when it comes to carpentry when you're not familiar with it and you're kind of coming in blind it's really difficult and a lot of the older guys who have been in the trades for a while didn't make it easy. A lot of the guys who have been in there for 30, 40 years, they have a different mentality and they made it very, very difficult for a lot of the younger guys. And so a lot of guys are tapping out, you know, when it came to the 2008 housing crisis, a lot of guys either retired or just got wiped out because they had like little small business. So it's becoming very, very difficult to find quality hands that are willing to, you know, take the back breaking labor, um, take the hours. I mean, a lot of times when it comes to being a carpenter, you don't know like uh, what your schedule is going to be sometimes, especially when you're pouring concrete or you have like a, a really tight schedule. It's hard to say, you know, I'm going to be here at seven and get off at three 30 every single day. That's very difficult. Even though most time of union, they do allow you to leave after eight hours. If you're going to stay with the company for a while, most of the time you're going to work overtime. That's going to be the demand, especially when they're running a tight crew where they don't have a lot of extra uh, manpower. It's kind of hard to let your guys down and say, you know, hey, I want to leave after eight hours and everybody else is working 10s and 12s. So I think it's really important that you know what you're standing up for when you do come a carpenter is that you're going to be the point guard of your job site. You're going to be the guys who, if there's no laborers there, you're going to be driving the forklift. You're going to be setting the steel. You're going to be doing the framing. If you're working with subcontractors and do something wrong, you have to fix it. We go through that all the time um, as carpenters. So I think because we're so slept on, because like we don't have the same credentials as other trades, it makes it very difficult to say, hey, if you're a high school student, if you have a choice of being an electrician, HVAC, plumber, elevator tech, or carpenter, which one are you going to choose? Carpenter is usually at the bottom. But I think that now as time has gone on, I think carpenters are going to have to take more of a, a pivotal role moving forward, especially with everybody saying, you know, 
housing prices are so expensive. Um, we need more housing. Well, who's going to build these houses? A lot of people look down on, you know, construction period, but especially carpenters, who's going to be building these houses that you guys are going to live in? Who's going to build these affordable uh, housing spaces? Who's going to be uh, revitalizing some of these older buildings and making the spaces where you can uh, move into? Who's going to do that? if no one wants to be a carpenter. So we're going to have to see something when it comes to wages increasing and kind of like a different kind of respect for carpenters. I know a lot of people watch YouTube videos and it's real easy to say, hey, I could do what that guy does. Or I see a lot of YouTube shorts and a lot of guys just really just like dunk on carpenters. But I think we're really slept on how difficult our job is, but also how expansive it is. I've worked for this one company for the last, I want to say six years with like almost, I've never been laid off this whole time, which is super, super rare for a carpenter. So I've worked there for six years and I've done everything as far as like carpenters can do. I've done siding, I've done concrete work for them. I've done wood framing. I've done, um, historic remodels we've done seismic upgrades we've done the whole entire gambit and that's what's so good about being a carpenter if you don't like the job you're doing most likely you'll be doing it for long because the turnover is quick you might finish that project turn to something else you might be doing siding now you're done with that now you're doing windows you might be doing that now you're doing doors and hardware so again carpenters you're the what you're asked to do is going to be super expansive so I think that they kind of need a little bit more credit. And I think it's going to come with finances because we're seeing on also on the internet, we're seeing um, a lot of things are getting automated now, right? A lot of things that we're seeing to be like the more prestigious jobs, engineering, uh, being a lawyer, being an accountant, a lot of stuff is now being able to be automated because the computer has such expansive amount of information. Now they're able to do your job. Now, what about those guys who are uh, being a carpenter? You can't really automate carpentry because there's so many different variables. Even if everything was perfect from the bottom to the from the bottom to the top, there's so many different things that can go wrong in carpentry. Almost nothing ever goes to plan. Nothing's ever perfect. So it's to be very, very hard for a robot to do our job. It's not take a screwdriver, tighten a screw. And just do that for eight hours. Our job is constantly moving. We're constantly having RFIs. We're constantly having things switch up. So I think too, <clears throat> like I said before, carpenters have to get more respect because they work hard. And I think with a supply and demand, whether you like it or not, the wages are going to go up. So I think it's really important to get in now while you still can, because after a lot of these jobs, you know, get automated. There's going to be a lot of guys looking for, you know, quality work. And I think carpentry can definitely offer that. Sorry if I'm rambling a little bit, but um, I kind of want to get into this article um, <clears throat> by, I think it's called um, The Hustler. Let me see real quick. Okay, so in this article, it talks about why America has so few carpenters. And it kind of goes over, you know, in this cycle, low paying jobs, place like McDonald's or Taco Bell, are grasping for the opportunity to make it to money so they can, so they're not pulling out their hair. Everything has changed when Colin bumped into a family friend who introduced him into carpentry. Now, that kind of same thing happened to me. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. And I wasn't really sure how I was going to progress further. And I kind of just, you know, was asking people on Facebook what they were doing. And I kind of just happened to get into the carpentry field. And I, and it's been a blessing to me. So let's kind of keep going on this article. So it says everything changed when Colin bumped into a family member who introduced him into carpentry. The first years weren't easy. The physical labor was taxing and Collins had to prove himself amongst experienced workers. As a black man, he faced discrimination while applying to jobs. Nevertheless, after a four-year apprenticeship, Collins, who was 57, embarked on a successful career that has seen his work in the union and non-union companies. And finally, as his own boss, his 
annual salary is around $75,000, enough to make a house in the suburbs between San Diego and Los Angeles and vacation in Mexico to save money. Now, this year I made $83,000 that meet with, with barely almost any overtime. And I also was able to go on vacation. I was also able to take my kids to Crater Lake and then, you know, a couple beach trips. So as a carpenter in the union, if you do not work, you don't get paid. So that means that if I probably would have worked, you know, the full um, 52 weeks with no time off and a couple, a little bit of overtime, I could have easily made over a hundred thousand dollars this year. I just chose to take a little break because one thing I've noticed is the more you work, you seem to get taxed a lot. And sometimes I feel like that's just not worth it, to be honest with you. So let's continue back to the article. He opened up and it says, uh, it opened up so much of the world and so many possibilities that has totally changed my life. Talking to a lot of carpenters, they express, they express similar warm feelings at their job. It's a rare profession that doesn't require uh, expensive education yet offers a decent pay. It's largely unaffected by automation and globalization. Aside from the occasional downturns, carpenters are in steady work. Yet, Mer yet Americans, there aren't many people falling in the career trajectory. Yeah, and so a, a little bit about that. You know, when they say that, you know, a lot of people are not following that same path, it kind of seems like for so long, you know, construction period kind of got demonized in the media. You might see guys wearing a vest and a hard hat, and there are always people that are catcalling women, um, and they're kind of harassing people, and people are kind of like saying, hey, if you don't do a good job, then you're going to be, you know, have to work in construction, and you have to have a the you know the metal the metal uh, lunch pail and you know get treated like shit and be around a whole bunch of like ornery dudes. But honestly, the pay is definitely worth it, especially if you're in the union. Now I can't speak on non-union jobs, especially in the residential, because I've heard the pay is definitely isn't as good. I've heard that for some reason uh, McDonald's wages are comparable in some areas, and so that makes it really difficult when you have a job that says, hey. You can be a framer in residential and get paid 19 bucks an hour or work at McDonald's for 17. That $2 an hour, especially when it comes to non-union, when you're saying you have to bring your own tools, uh, bring your own supplies and work your ass off for the same amount of money. That's a difficult, difficult sell, to be honest with you. Let's get back to that article. So it says, even amongst other construction trades which have faced uh, detention ret or retention and recruiting problems, for those, there are 400,000 unfilled jobs in March. And carpentry stands out for shortages. Builders are, f are having more trouble finding carpenters than roofers, electricians, and anything else by a wide margin. At the same time, carpenters stand out and it's important. Like I said before, Carpenters are the point guard of the job. They fill all the gaps where the other trades do not. A lot of times, if something, the whole job might stop if something is not right when it comes to the framing, if something's not right when it comes to steel. And a lot of times it falls onto the carpenters to fix those problems. We lubricate the job and make sure it continues to flow properly. These are indispensable for really any kind of residential carpentry project, Paul said, the VP of a survey of a housing policy research for the National Institute of Home Builders told The Hustle, as people reckon with expensive real estate amidst a national housing shortage, enduring long, time, enduring long wait times for repairs and remodels, the question is more important. Why doesn't America have enough carpenters? Reeling from the Great Depression, Great Recession, sorry about that. You don't have to look hard to find Americans trying and failing to hire carpenters during many of these errors. 
shortages pop up in regional bases as far back as the 1940s, and this has become entrenched nationally in the 90s. I've heard a lot of people tell me that, you know, when they work in the Midwest or they work in the middle of the country, you just get paid so bad as a carpenter, people just tap out. It's like, could they do it? Could a lot more guys or girls be carpenters, be in the trades? They could, but the wages are just so bad and the way you get treated, especially like working outside in the weather, it's so difficult. People like, I would rather go work at Walmart than have to get treated like shit, have old people disregard like what I'm going through in life, you know what I'm saying? And not treat with respect. So it makes it really difficult to recruit a lot of younger people, especially now, especially Gen Z. Gen Z is not with you just emotionally abusing them talking down to them. A lot of those people clam up already. They already don't want to have contact with people. So I can only imagine with the state of how people view carpenters and construction already, it's going to be really hard to recruit them. But the problem is things still have to be built. It doesn't matter what happens. So what's got to happen is the wages have to increase and they're going to have to find some ways to uh, automate some of the processes. Maybe they might start, um, building and framing off-site and is shipping all the pieces to the job site you might see a lot more of that i've seen stuff when it comes to like uh, uh building parts of a house like legos and then assembling all and on the job site itself so you have less uh labor going on on the job so maybe you can do it inside so there's gonna have to be some kind of reconciliation with how do you get people to buy into being a carpenter with some of the, taking some of the drawbacks of working outside, working for shitty wages, and working with the culture we do have in construction right now. So back to the article. It says since then, one of the briefs, one of the reprieves from the shortages has been the financial crisis hit in 2008, and there was no longer scarcity of carpenters because hardly anybody was building. But as soon as construction slightly bounced back in 2011, builders began worrying about the shortage of carpenters again. Many of the carpenters who lost their job in the financial crisis left the industry for good. And now the home construction is approaching pre-Great Recession levels and the shortages have reached new highs. And a 2018 survey by the National Association of Home Builders revealed in the 90s, single-family homes... One second. It says these numbers were higher uh, by the NAHB most recent poll from last November. Builders were finding it harder to hire three types of carpenters more than any other building trades. That's framers, rough carpenters, and finished carpenters. I'm assuming the rough carpenters is talking about like concrete, uh, demo, um, anything that doesn't involve maybe maybe siding, but I think siding might be considered considered finished work. It says, whenever we're in the term of a shortage of labor, the percentages are always the most acute in the widespread of category of carpenters. The carpenter shortage could be worse where if it not for the pandemic were to supply issues. Excuse me. Home builders would need even more carpenters if it wasn't taking several months to procure good lumber to enough how to buy it to build enough houses to start new houses but the shortages of carpenters has still led construction delays to a higher expense of builders okay one second let me add this real quick it's a question, bro. I'm 22 years old with no kids, but I don't know which trade to get into carpentry or electrician. Okay, so this is, I'm going to be honest with you. Electricians get paid more probably throughout the whole entire country because you have to get more certifications. Your apprenticeship is going to be uh, five years. I have a little cousin that's currently a electrician. It's a different skill set. You know, you're going to be doing the same thing over and over again, whether you're, uh, pulling um pulling wires you're snipping wires I, I can't really go into it too much because i'm only there like i see them roughing in stuff and 
pulling wire all the time, but it kind of depends on what you want to do. If you're talking about having a job that's going to be more like expansive, where you're going to do a lot more things, then definitely carpentry is going to be easier to get into. And you're going to be able to do a lot more, like a lot, diff a lot of different tasks, a lot of different jobs. And so I think that's definitely one of the benefits of becoming a carpenter because there's so many things you can do. Like say you're working for a company and you're doing straight concrete all the time. There's some companies in like uh, Portland, you might be working for um, Walsh or Perlo and they do like tilt ups where they'll pour the concrete on the ground and they'll just they'll make the walls and then they'll pull them up to make buildings you can do that you might be doing high rises and if you don't want to do cart if you don't want to do concrete you can go work at a place like intel and might do clean room and you might be working on their fab so there's definitely so many options when it comes to carpentry i'm a carpenter fanboy i i love carpentry so i definitely advocate for that and plus carpentry chose me so i'm definitely going to back carpentry's play every time Okay, let me show this one right here. I tried to apply for the apprenticeship in my area, but said they had they had a lot of applicants and to check back every month to see if I can apply and I'll keep trying. Okay, that's really important when it comes to um, the apprenticeship and your career. This is like any other job. There are going to be so many times. One second. Um There are going to be so many times that you are going to have to just suck it up and you have to keep going at it. You have to keep trying because when when if you don't have any prior experience for you to be accepted to an apprenticeship, especially if you're not going to pay for it, like the one I entered into, it's uh, sponsored through my local it's free. So they're gambling on you. So you have to really show that you're really, really devoted to being a carpenter, that you really care about coming into the trades. That's one of the most important things they say when you get your apprenticeship interview is that you need to have why you want to become a carpenter, like kind of really seared in your mind, because that's going to make it like be really apparent when you go and talk to these instructors, when you go and talk to these superintendents, because those who don't really have a passion for it, who feel like they're just going to tap out the very first opportunity they get, people don't want to invest money in that. So make sure that that's one thing that you really, really get down is why I'm doing it. And is this something that I'm willing to commit to for the long term, at least long enough to start to finish your whole apprenticeship, at least that long, at least. Okay, let me ask you this. Matthew Clark asks, I'm 32 years old. Is that, I'm 32 years old to start. Is 32, 33, my bad. Matthew, is it too old to start at 33? I have, I don't have a lot of prior knowledge and I'm a truck driver right now. The answer is no. Listen, I've worked on job sites with little old women who used to be nurses for 30 years retired and became carpenters it's never too late to start 33 is not too old a lot of times when it comes to carpentry definitely can get into it it's it's one of those things now where we need people who want to be in the field who want to work hard that's all it really comes down to you can be taught anything when it comes to carpentry this is not rocket science it's just hard work that's the most important thing. Carpentry is not rocket science. You can be taught everything. The question is, are you willing to accept the information? Are you going to be receptive? Are you going to listen? Are you going to apply the things that you learned? And if so, you will be successful, period. And just like, uh, just like Billy said, not at all, Matthew. You definitely can do it. Another question. Another question, bro. Trade school versus unions. I'm from Philadelphia, PA, and the union only have opening enrollments once a year. And I was accepted into a trade school that would take 13 months to train me. Well, this is the thing. When it comes to trade schools, are you it? Are you got the? Do you have to pay for that? And that's the, that's a major thing. Like, do you have to pay for the trade school? Do you have to take student loan debt out for the trade school? I 
like I said, when I applied for my union, um, I was it was through my apprenticeship was through my union. So it didn't cost me anything. But again, it is something that it doesn't open up all the time because they want to make sure that every apprentice that's in the actual apprenticeship doesn't have to suffer with not having a job. So they want to make sure that every apprenticeship that's that's in that's in the apprenticeship is constantly employed. So they don't want to have a huge swath of people that don't have a job. One thing I can advise if you're not going to go into the um up uh, the um go to the trade school route, you could probably ap apply to become a um carpenter's helper. That's what we have in Oregon. And so it's not necessarily a laborer, but it's someone who works for the carpenters that you kind of get your foot in the door. And then like most unions, apprenticeships will hire you if you have a job. They just don't want to have a huge swath of, you know, new enrollees that can't find work. And so now they have like a log jam of guys who are like no experience, can't find a job. It makes things more difficult. So if you can maybe get on as a carpenter's helper or maybe get hired, maybe get a letter of uh, intent to hire from a company, then you might have a better chance of getting to the uh, apprenticeship. It says, uh, for sure, thank you, man, for the feedback. I'm working with uh, Carpenters Building Bridges right now in my company, and I thought it was pretty awesome. Believe it or not, carpentry, even though it's really tough, you do a lot of dope things like um, I was just walking downtown with my um, son and my cousin and I was just pointing out like I worked on this building. I built this salon right here. Um, I was a part of this low income housing. I was a part of this building. As you go on, the work is tough, but a lot of times the guys, the guys make the work fun. A lot of the guys, because they work so hard, they're like a different kind of like salt of the earth type people. They don't take themselves too seriously. It's definitely, definitely something that like once you get past that like rough exterior, I have a ball almost every day. I can crack jokes, laugh. Guys take themselves too seriously. We work hard for each other. Everybody knows that. When you come to work, everybody's going to work hard for each other. No one's really going to be slacking off because we all know that we're all here for a good paycheck. At the same time, we're also here to make money for our company. So for me, it's been one of the best like work environments. Even though the work is tough, I definitely think it's dope. And especially when you see the product of your labor. A lot of times as carpenters, you might not even be there for the whole entire process. Like I've had so many jobs where I'll be doing siding or I'll be doing the framing. I'll get sent to the job and then two years later I'll come and the whole thing's done. And I'm like, that's dope. Even though I might have been there for the whole process, I was still part of, you know, this, this being created. And I think that's also something that is awesome. Okay. Let's go to Greg, Matthew Clark. I went to the carpentry as a machine shop when I was 37. I knew absolutely nothing showing up. Work hard, pay attention, and the rest will take care of itself. That's true. Like I said, when it comes to carpentry, it's really all about the attitude. And I said in our prior video too, what's something that's very, very important is you still are providing a service to your um, your community, your company. Your attitude is so important. If you just pay attention, have a good attitude, you don't have to be the top S tier, the baddest carpenter alive because most of us aren't going to be that. Most of us are going to be probably decent at our job, work hard, uh, do our best, and then go home. If you can do that, you'll be better than probably 70% of the dudes. Some guys stay on just because they show up every day on time. That's all it takes. So if you could do that alone, you're going to be fine. Okay, so it says the pre-apprenticeship is what they call in Cali a, a carpenter's helper. Yeah, um, for so in Oregon there are a pre-apprenticeship like programs, like it might be like a little class. So say if you've never ever ever like touched like a saw or been a part of uh you know with the impact or ever you know actually been familiar with the stuff, you can go to an actual class and they'll show you some of these things. So you're not flying out like completely blind me myself i came out 
completely blind. They just said, hey, go find a job. And once I found that job, I had no idea what I was doing. So I think a pre-apprenticeship probably would have helped me more. But, you know, hey, if you can get in there and get your foot in the door and make an impression maybe with your instructor or maybe go to some union meetings, that's where you're going to make those connections. Because believe it or not, a lot of guys who are in their unions, they're not going to the meetings that often. They're not being involved. And so those who are in the unions, they want to help guys get on. So if you uh, participate on that end, you definitely might have a way to get in because people see your attitude and they want to help guys who want to help themselves. So it says, uh, yo, bro, what is your goal for this year when it comes to carpentry? I just think when it comes to carpentry, my goals is just getting better. You know, there's certain things I'm not familiar with that I've never done before. Um, I kind of want to get on to more finish work because that's kind of like really shows like who's a really good carpenter and who's not. And I definitely want to perfect that. I've had some 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 opportunities, but not that much because I'm kind of a younger guy and they kind of want to keep those jobs for the older really experienced veterans, but I kind of want to get better with like hanging doors, doing trim work, maybe um doing something uh when it comes to some more expensive woods. I know we've done some projects where we built some really like nice like staircases on some um you know luxury hotels or luxury buildings. And I kind of want to get involved in that. So I kind of want to up my um carpentry game so that I can really, you know, do some more intricate work when it comes to carpentry. Okay, so let's get back to the article a little bit. <clears throat> so he says, he used to pay carpenters. So this is like, a, I think this is piecework. So he said he used to pay carpenters $2.50 per square feet to frame a house, and now he pays nearly three times as much, a cost that is passed on to the consumer. Yet even with the wages increasing, carpenters find that they're not making enough money. That's facts. I know so many people that build houses that cannot afford to live where they work or where they build. And I'm not talking about, you know, guys who are building in the most like extravagant areas. It's very, very hard to buy a house right now because there are so few carpenters. And if nobody's building, then there's no way people are not going to, people are going to afford to be able to buy these houses because inventory is so tight right now. So here's the next part. Why carpenters make far less than plumbers? If you compare the median wage of a carpenter to a fast work, fast food worker, a bus driver, or real estate agent, carpenters win. But if you compare carpenters pay to almost any other building trades, the other trades come out on top. Uh, a recent analysis of the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, by the uh, NAHB indicated carpenters with a median income of 48 k ranked in last for median income out of the 19 most common trades so you see that right there you have carpenters versus other trades elevator techs these guys elevator techs get paid the most this trade is damn near like a guild it is hard as hell to get into these guys uh work they're on call 24 7 and they get paid the big bucks i've heard guys making 150 Two hundred thousand. So I mean, if you want, if you had a real like pie in the sky type aspirations, elevator techs are definitely going to be one of those trades you're going to want to get into. Uh, pile driver operators, seventy-seven k. Uh, rock splitters. I have no idea what that is. May something to do with like excavators or something. I have boiler maker, sixty-six k. Uh, taper, sixty-one k. Uh, brick masons, electricians, 59K. Now, I, I think a lot of these numbers right here are um, non-union or maybe they're in a lower um, cost of living place. Electricians in my in my state are making about 100,000 easily. When you journey out, you're making 100,000 easily. I've heard of guys making 120, 130,000, especially if you go on a, a crew where you're working a lot of like six tens 
or you're working on a job that really needs a lot of production. And because they have so few guys, they're working the guys they do have a lot more. Okay, so it says, uh, the lower wage of the carpenters has been consistent for generations, although the difference between them and other popular trades previously wasn't that drastic. In the mid-1920s, for instance, the average carpenter's wage was 5% less than the average electrician. Now it's 14%, and the wage and the pay gap has also grown between carpenters and plumbers. Let's look at those numbers right there. Used to be $19. Twenty dollars and seventy-five cents, twenty-seven, fifteen to twenty-nine, and now it's twenty-six to thirty. And I've even seen that even in Oregon too. Like, um, I believe the electricians are making close to fifty now, and we're making forty-five. So, and they have uh, negotiations where I've I've heard some rumors that they might be making around sixty dollars an hour in like the next three years. So, that's a lot of money. But also, their jobs still are required for carpenters to do their jobs first. And so I understand that electricians, they do have a lot more like technical expertise and they have to have a lot more like uh, certifications. But that that discrepancy in pay is kind of wild still. It says you have to look at us the underpaid in relation to almost any other sector in terms of what you're putting in and what you're getting out financially. And this is from Ethan James. That's the honest carpenter. He has a great YouTube channel. I really, really enjoy a lot of his stuff that he talks about in his channel. James used to operate his own business in Raleigh, North Carolina area, allowing him to make more than union carpenters who work for construction companies. He typically signed up for projects being paid 60 an hour, but his rates still lag behind an independent plumber making 80 to 130 per hour, electricians 75 to 120 per hour, and HVACs 120 to 180 per hour. And that was uh, commanded in, in the similar regions. So let me get back to this. And I think that's one thing that's also with YouTube and people seeing a lot of DIY work. They don't really appreciate how difficult it is to uh, do the job correctly because you might see a guy who's been proficient, who's worked with these tools for all these years. And so when they are um, when, when they are doing this job, it looks really easily. But a lot of times you're going to try to do it yourself and you're going to fail and still end up hiring a carpenter to fix it after you. But one thing um, they talked about too is when it comes to electricians or HVACs or plumbers, their jobs are done so quickly that when they demand a 120, 200, if they're only working for two hours, maybe a day, you can you can do that. But if you have like, you know, a 40 hours or 80 hour job and you're uh, dealing out $200 an hour, that's a lot. And a lot of people think like they can't really afford to do that. So let me get back to these comments. Uh, the job corps and the UBC instructors in Western Massachusetts, we are loving what you're doing. Keep it up. Oh, thank you, bro. Hey, I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to spread the message. Uh, I, I attended Job Corps in Oregon. It was a great experience. I probably should have stuck with it. I was actually in the electrical program. So, uh, man, I probably should have stuck with it. it said I made a hundred and he says right here. I made a hundred and seventy five as an equipment operator. Jesus. Wow. That's a lot of money. I, I don't I want to know like how much overtime were you working? Like how many hours or did you have your own uh did you have your own vehicle? Like how did that work? How did you make that much? And are you thinking about becoming a carpenter now? Greg says, in 1920s, nobody had electricity, so it was not a good comparison. Yeah, I could see that. I I, I could definitely see that. I was I was hearing um on a podcast, they're saying that people want to go back to like 1950s um, lifestyles. But in the 1950s, a lot of the houses didn't even have running, uh, didn't have running plumbing. Like they didn't have, they didn't have uh, toilets. They had outhouses still in a large part of the South. So I definitely think that's a, a big, you know, comparison. Like when you're comparing 
electrical or plumbing or HVAC in certain areas, you're going to get paid a lot more, especially when it's a lot more like densely populated uh, places, states. It says, what is the longest you had to drive for a job? Um, I recently worked a job that I had to drive about an hour and a half there and it was about two hours home. And that's probably the, the most I'll do because I still have a family and like my company needed me to do this because like no one else would do it. So I'm kind of the guy that will like, I'll do it if no one else will, but only to a certain extent, like I'm not going to drive any more than two hours because then it becomes like, I'll have no time with my family. I still got to be with my son. I still take kids to like practice sometimes or, uh, you know, tutoring after school. So I try to keep that balance. Like if it's anything more than that, like I probably have to pass on it. And if I had to take a layoff, i will probably do that because I can't be driving three hours a day commuting. That's a lot of gas. That's a lot. More, and especially if it's not, they're not giving out a good like per diem. I definitely don't want to travel more than an hour and a half a day. So it says, I found out over the last 25 years, a high demand position was garage door installers. Almost every site is universal. You know, I, I can definitely see that too, especially when it comes to all the houses they're building. That might be something that's definitely like, um, kind of like, maybe everybody doesn't have expertise. And it's definitely something that you, you're going to want a quality person to do it because once you move in, you don't want to have to keep dealing with that you know, it malfunctioning and not working properly. So I can definitely see that being in very, very high demand, especially when we had that, you know, housing boom for the last like 10 years, even though they're not building a crazy amount of inventory, I'm, I'm still seeing a lot of house being built in Oregon. It's just, it's all in the higher end areas where the, the inventory is increasing, but so are the prices. They're all new builds and they're not really building like entry level homes. It says carpentry also has no emergencies. If your heat goes out in the winter or your toilet explodes, you will pay a premium to get that done real quick. The only thing I can really think maybe might be an emergency is like if you have like a roofing thing, something happening or. Yeah, you're right. Like a lot of the stuff will be things that you might know you need to fix, but you wait. Maybe you might have a leak or something. And when your walls, you might see some mold somewhere appearing and you can kind of put it off and put it off. It will cost you more in the long run, but I can definitely see that carpentry isn't the same level of like, I need it done right, right now. Unless you're talking about maybe uh, flooding or like a roof emergency. Also says the amount of time an HVAC guy gets paid $200 to show up to change a filter would shock you. Yeah. And I think that's one of those things too, where most people don't know about all of the intricacies when it comes to like what they're doing so that it makes it a lot easier for them to be able to charge more. Like it's kind of like doctors or engineers, you know, they have such more expansive information than you. So you kind of like trust them and, oh yeah, this costs a lot of money or like a mechanic. But when it comes to the carpenters, you're like, you have a hammer you have a nail. It seems pretty simple. If I can do it, I don't want to pay a guy a lot of money to do it for me. Same thing with like when it comes to like cooking. A lot of people think uh, the cook, um, I can do what they do. So I want to pay them a lot of money, but they took a lot of time to affect their craft. So that's why they charge a premium. And I think the same thing when it comes to carpenters, when he gets that like top level echelon where you're like doing the really intricate uh finish work or you're doing the real intricate woodwork that's when you might get paid a lot more money because when somebody can't really put their mind behind like how they they you do it it seems, it seems like you get paid more for the for that for some reason it says uh, this is chief when he said he made that hundred seventy five thousand dollars says i was working 68 hours a week as an equipment operator just got into the union last week local 619 in Cali. I wanted more home time. Again, that's something that's really important too. One thing that's great about being a union carpenter is the fact that you can have that balance. 
Now, there are going to be some times where they are going to ask you to work overtime, but a lot of times that time and a half is going to cost them a lot of money. So you want to keep that down, that premium down. You know what I mean? So, like I said, I made um, $83,000 this year, and I might have worked, I don't know, 30, 40 hours overtime this year. So barely almost any overtime, all of it is straight time. And I took a couple weeks off for a vacation. So you definitely can find a work-life balance as a union carpenter. Tyreek uh, Frederick asks, how has carpentry changed your life? First and foremost, when I first started, I didn't have anything to my name. I had barely any money. I was working on a food cart. I was really struggling, you know, uh, hoping for tips. I didn't, ha- I didn't own a car. I had to borrow uh, my wife's car. She was my girlfriend at the time. I had to borrow her car. Even when I first got into my apprenticeship, I was borrowing her car to drive to my job sites. And it really has transformed my life. I'm now a homeowner. I now have a, a, I have a, a, my own son. I Because I, I refuse to bring a kid into this world if I couldn't afford it. And so that was one of the biggest one of the biggest benefits of being a carpenter is the fact that I was able to afford being able to pay for uh, my son's daycare, being able to afford to really even pay for a child. You know what I mean? Um, like I said, I own a home now. I have a, a decent truck. I'm able to go on vacation. I'm able to see things I never thought would ever be in in the realm for me. You know what I'm saying? Growing up pretty poor. Um Growing up with a pretty pretty rough childhood, so being able to go see Tom Brady play uh, in Boston, going to Mexico, go be able to go to New York, going to Idaho, going to Seattle, things that a lot of people in my family have never done before, I had the opportunity to do because carpentry has been the engine that has really helped me be able to do that. You know what I'm saying? And that's really been one of the way that one of the ways that has changed my life. And that's why I'm always going to advocate to join the trades, to join the Carpenters Union. It doesn't matter if I stop today, I would still bang that drum because it definitely transformed my life. It's definitely been the engine that has allowed me to be able to invest in my YouTube channel, be able to buy uh, you know, equipment and not be able to stress about it. I'm able to buy laptops, you know, camera equipment, all that stuff. So it definitely made things a lot more accessible for me. So even if you don't want to do this for your whole life as a carpenter, say you want to get in, get out, be able to make this the financial engine to make other investments, that's definitely a possibility too. So always keep that in mind. This doesn't have to be forever if you don't want it to be, but this definitely is a great career choice to get you into that middle class, especially for those who come from more like impoverished backgrounds. TCs normally make the biggest dollars working for insurance companies doing restorations. Yeah. And um, I know one of the companies I work for, um, we do a lot of work with a lot of hospitals and we do a lot of work for like historic buildings. And there's some places when it comes to, especially the government contracts, they have a lot more leeway because they're not penny pinching as much. And so that definitely is something that, you know, was great about, um, working for a bigger general contractor, they have a little bit more flexibility. So they can maybe give you opportunity to learn something as far as like framing. I know some jobs you work for a company and they expect you to be a master at it or be fairly competent, or they're not going to let you do that type of work. But I work for a company that, that self-performs a lot of stuff. And so they've given me the opportunity to kind of learn on the job and not really like chastising. Everything's not perfect. And I think that's been a blessing. Um, I just learned how to do a lot of steel stud framing. They said, hey, listen, here's the plans. I'm working with the guy. Go ahead and see what you can do. And we pretty much worked it out. We we, we figured out you know some of the ways we can become faster. And over time, uh, we, we progressed and learned. And I'm and now I'm, I'm a pretty competent steel stud framer. I mean, I'm not perfect. I probably get blown out of the water by someone who does it every day. But at least you're able to get your foot in the door and learn some of these processes by you know getting the opportunity. I think that's really important too. Sometimes even if you don't, it's good to just jump out there and get your feet wet so that you know if it was crunch time, at least you have some kind of back work, uh, 
some, you have some kind of um, expertise you because you just tried it before. Tyreek Frederick said, that's tough, bro. Hey, man, I'm telling you, if you feel like, I know a lot of guys talk about, like, you know, they don't want to go to college. They don't know what they're going to do. They feel like their life is kind of like at a, a crossroads. My little cousin just went to the military because he said, you know, he doesn't want, he doesn't know what he wants to do. He kind of wants to get like more purpose, more grit, more determination. And I think that's also a great choice. But if you want to stay here and not potentially be involved in, you know, all the stuff the military has to go through, I think carpentry definitely offers that same opportunity of like every day getting up early. I get up at five o'clock every day, uh, make my own lunches. I don't go on buy you know, a lot of fast food. I make my own lunches. I'm there every day on time. It's stretch and flex. It's straight to work. And it's just every day doing the same thing. Because I know my guys are depending on me, so I'm not taking a lot of extra sick days off. It's just every day coming and just grinding. And then as that goes on more and more, you get more of like grit. You get more determination. You become more like solidified. And I think that's a really a really benefit of being a carpenter. It's like going through tough things makes you a, a tougher person, especially when you go to the other side and you see like, hey, as bad as I thought that was going to be, I got through that and now it makes you something where you can draw back on those past experiences to harken back when things get tough. And I think the more things you accomplish, the more you overcome struggles, the easier, you know, life becomes. And I think that's one thing that carpentry, that construction definitely offers that I think a lot of young guys are missing right now. A lot of guys are playing video games. They're getting these like achievements online. But those don't really translate to the real world. You know what I'm saying? Like when you master a game, well, two months later, three months later, a new game comes out. And now all those things you've learned aren't really applicable in the real world. One thing that's dope about being a carpenter or being in the trades is all those things you're learning are applicable in real life. You can go and buy you a fixer upper house. Or maybe go to your family member's house and you say, oh, my door's not swinging the right way. Well, you can go in your truck or go in your car, grab the grab your tools, fix it up for your family. You know, give back to your family. And I think that's one of the things that have been the real benefit for me is that not only have I been able to, you know, transform my life, but I'm also able to give back to my family, help my family out never needed. My little sister needed her air conditioning installed and she had no real way to do it the proper way, like as far as... um installing inside of her house so i was able to build like a little podium outside with um you know some two by fours and i think that was something that really gave me a sense of accomplishment because not only is this work applicable at my job site but i also can take this back into the real world junior knight says union strong baby it will change your life i totally agree the union can change your life bro it says, I just got into the Carpenters Local 237 Apprenticeship January 3rd. This year, prior military also. Military also. I know that a lot of times, if you have been in the military before, it's kind of like a cheat code to get into the apprenticeship. The, um, the apprenticeship wants to hire as much veterans as possible. I know a lot of places have a um, helmets to hard hat program. And a lot of times you will start off as a second term if you have no prior knowledge, because just because you uh, finish your military deployment, that shows that you have at least the skills of a second term apprentice off top. It says Tyreek Frederick, I was literally in the same position, bro, you was in and I need a career and I really appreciate you explaining your story. Truly motivating, bro. 100 percent, bro. And, and, and this is why. Um, this is why I started my channel in the first place because I kind of wanted to give back because I didn't really know. I kind of felt guilty because I had found some success in life and I felt like, you know, why did I, why am I successful? And so many of the people that I know aren't. And so I kind of felt like if I could maybe duplicate that process, if I can kind of help other people, it can kind of prove that it wasn't just luck. And I know that kind of might sound kind of 
like egotistical a little bit, but I kind of felt that I wanted to show other people because I didn't want to have the success by myself. You know what I mean? I want to help other people get into the trades, expose them just because again, I'm not in, you know, a top level carpenter where I'm like the most Billy badass. I'm just a decent carpenter. I come in every day. I do my work and I have a, a really good life. And I just want that for more people. So if my videos can help or if these live streams can help, that's all they really ask for is that I can kind of spread that message because my life got transformed. And I hope that a couple other guys might see these videos or girls and, you know, help them improve their life. I think that's one of the main things I want to, uh, kind of convey to you guys i says love that you are real about the pros and cons brother and how how humble you are yeah man uh you know the, a lot of these things are tough but at the same time it's also something that i feel like everybody can do if they want to put their mind to it and they get that extra effort if you're willing to do it then i think that this can definitely be something that will be a game changer for a lot of people it says can you pay can you pay a union out of pocket to train you without working for a union or being a carpenter i'm not sure if if our apprenticeship offers that i don't think so i think this is kind of like a, a all-in-one package but i definitely know that there are some other programs that will uh train you to become a carpenter outside of just um you know our apprenticeship there are other other um colleges and stuff but i believe that a lot of those do cost money though it says and also thank you for the occidental bag setup my uh journey has been uh my journeys have been impressed with how prepared i was you know what that's that's big that's big when you have all your stuff kind of like in line that you kind of know where everything fits and situated you look more professional you look you know what you're doing you're ready to work that's a big deal i know a lot of apprentices when they first start off they have tools and different parts they have fasteners and tools mixed together they uh, have like what they call uh, car uh, apprentice bags where you have screws and nails all in the same little pouch area you know what i mean so it definitely helps when you have everything organized. You look more professional. So when somebody's asking you to do something, you can get right on task and jump right into it. Yes, John, that's true. Uh, it's, it is possible that there are other trade uh, school programs that aren't affiliated with the union that you definitely could probably try to look out for. So um, I'm going to do some research and look and see if I can help you out. If you haven't before, if you haven't checked before, join the Discord channel. I'm going to drop that link in the chat. And so if you have any questions for me and I haven't answered you for them in this live stream, I definitely will uh, be able to answer those in my uh, Discord channel. There you go. I just dropped the Discord link right there. Yeah, so let's let's go let's art, finish the article out, and then I will be heading out. I know it might be late for a lot of you guys, so. Okay. <clears throat> So it says, here's why carpenters make less money than their peers in the trades. Extensive nature of the work. Carpenters projects, both remodels and new builds, often take weeks or months, whereas plumbers and electricians can finish a job in a matter of hours. James says it's hard to charge for higher amounts over longer periods of time. And there's a lower barrier of entry. Carpenters do not have to go through extensive licensing processes in most states, as electricians and plumbers do. In Raleigh, James says, most can buy a tool bag and call themselves a carpenter. And this is Honest Carpenter right here. And he talked about that in this video. That's true. A lot of guys can pose as if they are, you know, qualified carpenters. 
by just showing up with some tool bags on and brag about all their prior experience. But then when it comes down to it, a lot of these guys are just living up bravado. Do not be one of those guys on a bigger job site. Do not talk about how good you are as a carpenter and all the things you've done. If you're not badass, like if you're not like top of the food chain in carpentry, do not brag because all it's going to do is, first of all, make you look super foolish and it's going to make everybody roll their eyes and want to dismiss you because you're not that guy. If, if anything, it's better to be humble and keep what you know to yourself so that way you can overperform opposed to like underperforming based off of your mouth writing a check that your ass can't cash. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's a really big deal. Do not oversell how good of a carpenter you are, especially when there are so many facets you might not be familiar with. You may be a dope ass framer, but then they may take you to a place where you're doing a high rise building and something you're unfamiliar with. And then you might be, you know, swimming in deep waters you're unfamiliar with. And that's why I do recommend if you are coming from the non-union side, at least try to join as an apprentice, maybe further along, maybe six or seventh term. You most likely be making more than you would as a non-union guy. But at the same time, you get a chance to go to the school a little bit. You get a, you get a chance to pick some of the instructor's brains. And also, you have that grace of being a apprentice. If you jump straight from non-union straight to union, there might be so many things that you haven't done or haven't seen that there's going to be a lot of apprentices running circles around you because they may have done it for two years and they may not know everything you know, but they may be more experienced in these parts. And so it's going to make you look kind of foolish. So I think it's important that you do not oversell how good of a carpenter you are. You know what I mean? So it says, Despite the lower barrier of entry, carpenters still have to pick up skills that are as difficult to master and require as the high paying trades while risking injuries, knee pains led to James stopping his career and focusing more on his popular YouTube channel. Why is no one going to do carpentry anymore if they don't make money doing something else, if they can make more money doing something else, especially more money to another trade, James says, coupling with the Great Recession spurred exits of carpenters from the workforce the salary gap as a economic reason for america's carpenter shortage but there's also a cultural reason why carpenters numbers have been low for so long disenfranchise the women in black workforces now this is this is definitely true there is there is something to to be said about um women and uh black people in the trades and i i can attest to that but i i'm also privileged that i do live in a more progressive state so i can't really speak on like you know dealing with like a lot of racism on my job and also when it comes to being on the trades you have to have more of a thick skin um you're not coming into uh candy land this is not shoots and ladders guys might just bust your balls and it might not be a thing where it's like a a racist remark it may just be like you know guys might be just insensitive they don't know like every cultural touchstone so they may say something that they may be perceived as just a joke you may be perceived as racist or you may be, be perceived as insensitive so i'd much rather just say i give people grace because I require grace. And so if somebody says something that you feel like is inappropriate, just pull them aside and let them know like, hey, you said something I didn't like. And so here's why uh, I don't appreciate that. But make sure that you don't fly off your lid. I had some guys, somebody said something to them they thought might have been racist and they just jumped off the handle. They started cussing the guy out. They started yelling, yelling at the superintendent and it may feel good in the moment that you feel like you got them and you showed them, you, you showed them you're not no punk or you won't take that abuse. But it's like now people look at you as like you lack self-control, you lack the ability to problem solve. We're going to get you off this job as soon as possible, as soon as it blows over. So I do not advocate going off the rails when it comes to uh, racial issues or 
like maybe if you're a woman, uh, like sexist issues. If a guy is being a creep, which I mean to say this, there are some guys that are creeps, that are carpenters, that like when there's a woman on the job, they start acting really skittish and weird and they start acting really like creepy and they start, you know, trying to like be around the girls, girls a lot and saying weird things like, don't do that, bro. Like if you are another guy, pull that guy to the side. No person should ever have to feel uncomfortable or get weird, weird vibes from guys because they don't know how to handle themselves just because they are at your job doesn't mean that you are, they are required to give you attention. It's really weird. I know a lot of married guys who maybe have no attention from any other females, and so they get really weird on jobs where there's girls at. Just don't do that, bro. This is not the time for that. It's not the place for that. Do not be a weird, creepy guy. It's strange, and if you are a guy that sees that, pull them to the side. It's just weird. Don't do that. And I've again, I've seen this a lot of times. I've seen where guys are trying to do like other like young apprentices, girls work for them and trying to get them to the side to like do dinner dates and weird stuff. Just don't do that, bro. I, I could just just don't be that guy. It's creepy. Just don't do it. Dances number 14. Whoop. It says, uh, William says, there's none in my area with night school. That's tough. That's tough. John, join the Discord. Easiest to present other options with the chat form. That's true. If you join the Discord, I dropped the link. It makes it easier to uh, conversate, and it makes it easier for me be able to answer your question. I think I dropped the link to it. I don't see it in here, but I'll try to drop it again. Okay, there you go. I just dropped right there in the Discord chat. There you go. Okay, so one last time. Let's finish this uh, last article, and then we will call it a day. This has been a lot more successful than I expected. Um, I have never been able to make it this long at a live stream by myself, so I really appreciate you guys um, sticking with me. Um, again, I really appreciate you guys. It says, Nakia Hunter was inspired by construction as a young age, dreaming of turning raw materials into something communities can use forever. But her father warned her that she'll never make it. My dad kept kept and prevalent in my mind that I wasn't a space that I'd be brought into. And he was right. Most young carpenters face hazing when they start out. But Hunter, like many black and female carpenters, dealt with racial animus and isolation one time she said two carpenters pulled back a two by four of lumber and let it slap her in the face that's foul that's foul i mean th there are there are little weird things that guys do as far as like hazing maybe putting a two by in between two saw horses and asking a guy to cut it because they know it's going to bind up or uh, having guys look for tools that don't exist board stretchers and whatnot but again that's foul between the verbal and physical abuse and the failure of experienced carpenters to lead uh, carpenters to provide instruction, it took her seven years to finish her apprenticeship that was supposed to take four. Now, that's one big thing, too, when it comes to um, the carpenter trades in our in our union apprenticeship in Oregon. You're able to get a lot more mentorship if you need it. Um, a lot of times you can come after work and go into these classes and get the help that you need. Uh, there's a lot of open doors. It's just you have to express that you need help. You know what I'm saying? 
And if you are more active in your union, you can get a lot more help when it comes to representatives. So definitely make sure that you are putting out there that you need help or putting out there that you need more um, one-on-one time with your instructors. You can probably come after work. A lot of times you open up the shop floor at five o'clock. So if you need more like um, certain things that we worked out for you, that definitely could be an avenue for you. So it says to get to other workers to train her and eventually rise to level foreman, Hunter said she had to be comfortable she had to conform to be an asshole and laughed at the racist and sexist jokes as she regular regularly heard. Nakia Hunter said she had plenty of people leave carbon shirts for dealing with abuse and discrimination as apprentices. That's true. And it says Collins, who wrote the Black Carpenter's Guide, experienced similar racism in San Diego area. He recall he rec- he recalled instances where leaders at union jobs would tell him no work was available, only to hear coworkers that the leadership was bringing to everyone except black carpenters. When he did join the job, he often he often would be excluded from high paying positions like foreman. They also wanted to show up and be happy and keep his mouth shut. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. Carpentry is not only a trade plagued with systemic racism and sexism. But the few diverse statistics available indicate there's a problem that may be worse than other trades, preventing carpentry from attracting a wide pool of prospective workers. I don't know, man. I don't really like I don't really like uh the whole systemic and racism and sexism and stuff. Is it true that there have been like, you know, for a long time carpentry was dominated by like white guys? That's true. But am I going to say like there are a lot more barriers now than there were back then? I think there are a lot less barriers now. I think that a lot of people want to give minorities, women, especially in the UBC, they're definitely advocating for people who have never done this before. Because again, you do want more uh, diversity of thought, diversity of backgrounds, because it helps us get better. Maybe some guys have some prior information that can help everybody exceed and progress. So I, I don't, I don't like, uh, skewing everything towards the racism, sexism thing. I think that makes things really div- divisive when it doesn't need to be, especially if you're in a union, this is definitely not the route that I would take, but I would, I'm, I'm more on a, how can we help each other get better? How can we help our common man become better? Now, and if stuff so stuffing is going on on your job that is wrong, just call it out. You know what I'm saying? Not, maybe it doesn't have to be a big show, but everybody is there to make money. There's everybody's there to provide for their family. So if we all work together, we can make this a way better experience for everybody. Because again, when the jobs fall behind and we're not meeting the quotas, we can't get the manpowers, it hurts everybody. So make sure that we're all being the best people we can be so that we can we can have the best reputation as carpenters. This is according to the HBCI or HBI, a non a nonprofit partner with the National Association of Home Builders. 30 percent of carpenters are foreign born and the share of uh, painters, roofers and drywall installers and cement masons is 39 percent or higher. It says only three percent are women. And they make up 40% of the women workforce overall and only 11% of construction professionals. This is only 6% of carpenters are black, which is in line with the rest of construction industry. And that's below the, the share of black employees representing the entire economy, which is 12%. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, I'm pretty much the only black guy on the majority of jobs I go on to. Uh, like I said, I live in Oregon, so there's not like a huge black population. But still, then again, uh, you just got to do what you got to do, man. Like if you need someone to look like you to make you more comfortable, then construction is going to be a little more difficult. But I definitely think that if you want to make a change in your life and your family, this is definitely the way to go about it joining the trades becoming a carpenter are there some are there some things that make it tougher if you are 
like black or minority? Probably so. But is it something you can overcome? I think so. Is it something you can have other guys lean on or other women who've, who've done before come back and help you? Yes. And that's why I have my Discord channel. If you feel like you want to quit because you're having a tough time, hit me up in the Discord channel. Let's talk about it. If we have to get, you know, your rep involved or whatever we can do that but just make sure like don't give up just don't give up because you definitely can make it through if you have to switch the company you're working for whatever you have to do to be successful in this let's do that just don't give up and don't let these people win if somebody is holding you down if somebody's being uh, a jerk or asshole and that's the reason why you're having a miserable job it's much better to uh leave that company then abandon the whole trade period like i said again it's going to take all of us to make this a more pleasant experience uh, a lot of older timers are leaving a lot of boomers are leaving the trades especially with the pandemic a lot of them retired early so we're going to have to recruit different generations more millennials gen uh gen z so make sure we're all doing our part i appreciate you guys i know it's getting pretty late so again Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate you. And let's see how we can change uh, the trajectory of the carpenter field. Thank you guys again. And I appreciate you.